Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world, and Happy New Year. This is the first session of the uh, financial statement series at the Peterson Institute, and uh, we have a stellar cast today. Uh, couldn't speak of better speakers for uh, our topic today, which is obviously related to uh, the war in Ukraine that has dominated much of uh, 2022. And I cannot say it every time, but I'll say it for this first session of the year. As usual, this series is made possible by the diligent and super efficient work of Sarah Chu, Jessica Parada, and the whole team at the Peterson Institute, without which uh, nothing would happen. And also uh, uh, Yvonne Priestley, who is retiring this year, but has uh, been the pillar of uh, this series and all the events at Peterson for uh, longer than anybody else can remember. Um, so thanks, Yvonne. Uh, Oli Rehn, uh, obviously is the governor of the Bank of Finland. Uh, he has had an incredibly rich career until now, uh, mixing um, policy, politics, uh, scholarship, and football, or I should say for our American audience, uh, soccer. Uh, he studied at Manchester, uh, uh, McAllister College, sorry, uh, in St. Paul, Minnesota, and at University of Helsinki. Oxford St. Anthony's College, where he got his PhD in 1996, I should mention, on corporatism and industrial competitiveness in small European states, which is a topic that never gets old. Uh, then he was, uh, actually before that, uh, uh, as early as 1987, he was the president of the Finnish Centre Youth, which is the youth wing of the uh, Finnish Centre Party, Centre Right Party. Uh, he was a city councillor in Helsinki in 1988, President of the Central Party uh, that same year until 94, member of the Finnish Parliament in 91, special advisor to the Prime Minister Esko Aho uh, in the early 90s, then a member of the European Parliament for the centrist now Renew Group in 1995, chairman of the Premier Division of Finnish Football uh, in 96 and 97, which I think is one of the most, uh, uh, one, uh, one of the distinctions I uh, don't have uh, often enough uh, in the series. Head of staff of um, uh, Commissioner Erki Likanen uh, in, between 98 and 2002. Uh, head of the Center for European Studies at the University of Helsinki, so back to academia in 2002. Then again, uh, again advisor to the Finnish Prime Minister this time, Matthias Van Hanen in 2003. And then for a decade uh, from 2004 uh, to 2014, European Commissioner. Uh, first for enterprise and the information societies and for enlargement, and then most uh, memorably, perhaps, uh, for economic and monetary affairs, when Oli Rehn, of course, was uh, a, a principal player in the European uh, or the Eurozone crisis. And I have to uh, mention here one of his books, Walking the High Wire, which uh, tells that story and uh, which I highly recommend. Uh, I think one of the very best books uh, that have been written on the, Euro on the Eurozone crisis. In 2014, he returned to the European Parliament as, a, as an MEP and to the Finnish Parliament. Uh, in 2015, he became Minister of Economic Affairs in Finland. And uh, in October 2016, he joined the board of the uh, Bank of Finland and became its governor in July 2018. So as such, of course, he's involved in the euro system as a member of the governing council of the European Central Bank and all kinds of uh, related bodies. Uh, Julia Friedlander studied at Princeton, her BA in 2006 on uh, the historical and economic origins of the EU, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, then at the uh, Science School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins, um, uh, Masters in International Energy Policy, also very topical now, and International Relations in 2010. She was then an economist and uh, an, an economic analyst at the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency for four years uh, between 2011 and 2015, then worked at the U.S. Treasury as senior policy advisor for Europe uh, in the Office of Terrorist Financing and Financial Crimes, which is part of the it's the policy side of the broader Office of Tourism and Financial Intelligence, which includes everything related to sanctions and anti-money laundering uh, in the U.S. Treasury. And then she worked at the National Security Council, that means in the Trump White House, that must have been interesting, for three years uh, until June 2020, so um, uh, the year of the election as director for the European Union, Southern Europe and Economic Affairs in the European um, part of the National Security Council. Uh, then she worked at the Atlantic Council, where she was 
uh, Boyden Gree Senior Fellow, and in June 2022 joined um, Atlantic Brookham, which is a leading network of you know, transatlantic exchanges between Germany and the US in Berlin, where she's the chief uh, executive, or I should say the Geschäftsführerin. Um, thanks again to both of you, and um, Oli, over to you. Many thanks, uh, many thanks, Nicola, and uh, yeah, that's for the kind of work, words of uh, introduction. Uh, I feel uh, always a bit embarrassed with my CV, uh, and uh, you made it sound like uh, I would be an endless, ardent uh, tent worker. Why not? Uh, perhaps that, that fits uh, into the geek economy of the, of the 21st century. Anyway, uh, greetings from uh, a snowy Helsinki and uh, Thank you very much for this uh, chance to ex exchange uh, views uh, with you at this event uh, today. My topic today is uh, Finland's experience in uh, building, uh, building up resilience and uh, preparing the economy and uh, financial system to cope with uh, hybrid uh, warfare. I have a few slides and uh, I pick my slides. So next, uh, this is uh, here. So. Here we go. I hope you can see it. So let's set uh, the scene first. Uh, around a year ago, a rapid recovery from the COVID pandemic uh, was well underway in, in Europe. Those uh, positive prospects uh, were crushed uh, last February by Russia's uh, illegal and uh, brutal attack against uh, Ukraine. The horrific uh, bombardment of uh, critical Ukrainian infrastructure has left uh, millions of uh, Ukrainians uh, at the mercy of uh, harsh winter conditions. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, no end to the war is in sight. Uh, we need to be prepared uh, for a long confrontation between uh, Putin's uh, Russia and uh, the liberal West, uh, or more broadly, between authoritarian regimes uh, and uh, liberal democracies. Moreover, Russia's war has been a litmus test uh, of uh, European unity, which has uh, lasted. Uh, supporting Ukraine in its uh, fight for freedom remains uh, a key policy priority in Europe. Uh, for Finns, uh, this is uh, really close to our hearts, uh, also by our own experience. Uh, after all, we were attacked uh, ourselves uh, by the Soviet Union in the Second World War. And we still have the we still have uh, Europe's longest border with uh, Russia, which is uh, 832 miles or 1,340 kilometers. Let's see, we, uh, can I change the slide? Here we go. Yeah. The security policy environment uh, of uh, Europe and uh, of Finland uh, is uh, currently in transformation and it's transforming, it's being transformed uh, as rapidly as it did uh, in the early 1990s, uh, but only this time in reverse, uh, unfortunately. In parallel with this, uh, the rise in uh, energy prices uh, has uh, slashed uh, living standards uh, and uh, inflation has surged uh, and uh, become more broad based. The economic outlook uh, this year is uh, marked by pervasive uncertainty. All the while, globalization is at risk uh, of coming apart at, at the seams, uh, and uh, the European security order has been smashed uh, and is uh, searching for a new form. Consequently, the current environment has amplified uh, the role of uh, national preparedness uh, and uh, resilience uh, especially in countries like Finland uh, that uh, share a border with, uh, with Russia. Due to Finland's uh, long and complex history with uh, Russia and vice versa, including the Winter War and uh, Continuation War during the Second World War and uh, decades of uh, Soviet-Russian uh, post-war post interference uh, in domestic politics, uh, Preparedness uh, is uh, something that has never been far from our minds. It is actually one of the few issues in uh, Finnish society that uh, virtually nobody questions. 
which is rare in, uh, in any democracy. So how does this uh, strong will to defend uh, the country translate uh, into practice? Uh, well, to begin with, uh, we never got rid of uh, conscription, which is uh, mandatory for men, though non-military service uh, is uh, an option and it is uh, voluntary for women. Our defense forces are fully interoperable with uh, NATO, which will smooth the transition to full membership. Uh, an interesting fact uh, may be that uh, currently Finland has uh, the largest uh, artillery capacity in uh, Western Europe. These are, there are many elements uh, to our civil preparedness. Uh, for instance, uh, we have uh, a very diversified uh, energy supply, including uh, various forms of uh, renewable energy and uh, nuclear power. And uh, our national emergency supply agency maintains uh, sufficient stockpiles in critical materials uh, in cooperation with the private sector. The organizational framework uh, for national preparedness uh, links uh, the public, uh, private uh, and uh, third sectors uh, in uh, both planning, coordinating and uh, monitoring resilience uh, and the security of supply in their respective spheres. This framework for national preparedness uh, covers uh, horizontally all relevant sectors of the economy and uh, society, including the financial sector. The Bank of Finland uh, has its uh, own role in promoting financial sector preparedness. Our mandate uh, in this context is uh, based on uh, our oversight function the objective of oversight uh, is to ensure the reliability and uh, efficiency of these uh, systems uh, for the society as a whole. These, these systems uh, link uh, financial institutions uh, together and uh, they enable the flow of uh, payments, uh, liquidity and uh, uh, capital. Even though we have uh, pretty much always uh, had a realistic view of uh, Russia and uh, national preparedness uh, has for long been a key national objective. Still, uh, the 24th of February last year was uh, an eye opener. And uh, as a society, we have to set uh, many of our priorities uh, anew. Negotiations with the Finnish financial sector regarding improvements uh, to our backup systems uh, had uh, in the previous years uh, been proceeding, say, in an unhurried uh, manner. But after Russia's invasion of Ukraine began, uh, there was uh, no time, no more time to, time to spare. The financial sector authorities uh, set up uh, a task force uh, to review the existing backup systems. Uh, we created a backup plan for additional two severe scenarios which were not sufficiently covered by the existing previous plans. The first scenario is a severe disruption of elementary customer services in an account holding bank, for instance, due to a serious cyber attack or malware. The second scenario is a severe disruption of uh, our critical resources uh, outside the country or the undersea cables uh, on which uh, Finland's digital economy and society do rely to a great extent. So what's the response? Uh, as a response to the first scenario, we created a national emergency account system where the disrupted bank's uh, customer data could be uploaded uh, from the Finnish Stability Authority, which actually is the Resolution Authority. The model is similar to the US uh, Sheltered Harbor solution, with which uh, some of you might be uh, familiar. For the second scenario, the Bank of Finland uh, created a facility that uh, enables our banks uh, to transmit uh, interbank payments, uh, even if uh, cross-border resources uh, 
were not uh, available. And what is significant is that um, we managed uh, to ramp up uh, our preparedness uh, for the most severe scenarios uh, in the span of a couple of uh, weeks and uh, months uh, last spring. The required uh, legislation obliging banks uh, to maintain capability to connect uh, to these systems uh, was passed uh, by the parliament uh, in a very speedy manner. In fact, uh, the final decision was uh, was taken uh, in the parliament's uh, last uh, spring session in early July. The key success factors uh, here were the analysis on uh, possible backup solutions uh, that uh, had been carried out uh, in previous years uh, and uh, the unanimous uh, determination to ensure the resilience of uh, basic uh, banking services uh, under all circumstances. So, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, uh, I have uh, briefly explored uh, how Finland, uh, Finland's resilience uh, is uh, built on an all-encompassing culture of uh, preparedness uh, also covering the financial sector. This has allowed us to react uh, swiftly to the changing geopolitical and uh, security situation in Europe, uh, including the decision to apply for NATO membership uh, together with uh, Sweden last May. Acceptance of uh, our membership uh, has uh, unfortunately been delayed uh, due to the lack of ratification in Turkey and uh, Hungary while not yet uh, critically damaging these uh, delays uh, of course uh, play to the hand of putin and uh, risk weakening the credibility of uh, liberal democracies uh, unity our own uh, national capabilities uh, form the basis of our crisis response uh, but uh, international cooperation is uh, equally important uh, and in this regard uh, europe has uh, not stood uh, idly by Many vulnerabilities uh, still need uh, addressing uh, this work in progress. Uh, however, uh, it is important uh, and uh, in fact imperative that uh, we heed the lessons of uh, Russia's aggression and its war in Ukraine, especially in the energy and uh, financial sectors. It is telling that uh, since uh, February 2020, Google searches for the word uh, resilience uh, have uh, risen to new highs uh, and they have stayed uh, elevated uh, ever since. Uh, in matters of uh, resilience, uh, we look for safety, we look for predictability, and uh, we look for a sense of uh, control. Uh, I believe that uh, the early 2020s uh, will be remembered uh, for the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and uh, Russia's uh, brutal war. Our response uh, to this crisis uh, will determine what the rest of the decade uh, will look like. Thank you very much for your, for your attention and uh, looking forward to the extensive views. Thank you, Governor Ren. Uh, Julia. Thank you so much, Nicola. It's a pleasure to do this uh, webinar with, with Ole um, And thank you so much to Peterson for, for organizing this. Uh, greetings, so not from a snowy place, but a rainy place um, from uh, from Berlin, <laughs> where I've been uh, the past uh, past six months. Um, I think this is what, um, uh, what the governor is, is highlighting, I think, um, extensive sort of a broader theme of how we combine um, economic equities and the sort of financial infrastructure um, that we, uh, uh, global infrastructure and domestic financial infrastructure with national security priorities and national security frameworks. Um, you know, I think it's no surprise uh, to, to us now, but I think, you know, a year or two ago, we might have been um, a little more questioning a little bit more why um, why NATO, for example, was discussing uh, the financial financial world and critical infrastructure as, as part of potentially part of its rubric. Um, 
And what, what this, I mean, what this does though is shows some sort of in, sort of institutional organizational tensions, perhaps. Um, and I think that you know, I'm, I you know, I think that Finland is, is a primary example of, of public pri private cooperation and integration bet within government institutions. Um, I would probably wager a bet that many other countries are not as coordinated in, in executing on this um, throughout Europe, and certainly not um, in the uh, in the very fragmented financial system that we actually do have in the United States. So. Um, I think that there are many, many lessons, um, uh, Governor Wayne, that um, the countries can learn um, can learn from you. I think that you know, um, and I know that um, Finland actually prioritized uh, securing the financial infrastructure before the war, actually during the um, Finnish uh, EU Council presidency in 2019. So I remember having some conversations with colleagues of yours about that at the time. I mean, if you think about it, you're talking about um, a security risk categorized and sort of qualified by NATO. Um, the financial infrastructure and regulation that is set forth uh, by the ECB and the European Commission. Um, the domestic, central banks domestically, but then also the, um, the infrastructure of the international financial system, commercial banks, financial, financial service providers, um, and all the interlinkages in between, right, that could be subject to some sort of hybrid attack uh, or cyber attack. Who is responsible for ultimately securing that? Right, you need to. Is it are they? Is it a private firm? Right, a private security firm. Are they government agencies and intelligence agencies that can predict and potentially interdict these attacks? Um, are they? Is it the you know financial infrastructure themselves, the banks? I mean, internally, um, you know, within internal controls. Again, this is all of the um, all of the greater questions that I think we do have to ask ourselves. Um, but but I but I think that you know I'll put sort of a, a code on that and say. We have to. We also have to ask why it hasn't happened yet in such a um, <laughs> you know to if it's if it's if it's such a sort of sort of the navel of of of, um, of ensuring the stability um, of commercial and capital based economies right that are so um, are so premised on the movement uh, the movement of capital and of transactions clearing right through many through many different myriad clearing agencies and service providers why something like this hasn't happened yet that's the that's the question that I that I that I more broadly ask myself and I think the answer and I would like to hear the governor's response and, and Nicola and, and, and everybody is that you know we are talking in many in many ways about something that would be a self-inflicted wound to the extent that um, countries remain and their financial sectors remain largely interoperable with each other. Um, the more we see fracturing of financial financial infrastructure, um, the more we create comparative advantages and shield certain sectors of the financial system off from hybrid tax. So I think that you know the more we the, the sort of it's a double-edged sword. The more that we shield ourselves, and the more we potentially are creating points of leverage for others, right? And so that's sort of um, uh, the, the siloing of the financial systems to sort of um, risk that um, the in, in increasing digitization of. Uh, of, of finance um, is also a, um, a wide open field, uh, specifically when we're talking about digital currencies and central bank digital currencies, which provide a whole new set of risks than commercial banking does. So um, I think we are sort of on the on the forefront of um, as we continue to use um, economic and financial levers in the security context, right? And as as, as, a, as sort of um, trump cards against each other, right? The more that we are going to incentivize actors to try to think creatively about how they can affect some of these things, um, and I'll you know I'll sort of uh, close my initial thoughts by saying, well, you know, maybe a little provocatively. Is that we, you know, the <laughs> the G7 central banks effectively did that against Russia when they blocked access to foreign exchange reserves held in their jurisdiction, right? Because that was an act of of um, basically a, an act that could have, and we didn't know at the time, and 
The Russians did a very, very good job of managing it um, on their side, but could have triggered a a, a, um, a much more messier, a messy default. Of course, if you're cut off from creditors, it matters less if you default, but also a commercial banking crisis, depending upon how it was managed and depending upon how capital controls were implemented. So again, from their perspective, you see that that is, that is one tool that, um, that happened to be at our disposal because we had that, we had certain points of leverage um, over uh, over Russia at the time. So um, that's just sort of a um, a uh, sort of a point of reference that you know we're not only the ones who are in the defensive mode. We are clearly in the offensive mode as well. Well, um, very sobering thoughts and um, and very thoughtful um, warnings. Uh, lots of questions uh, from me, but. Um, well, there is a first question, which is a question of fact. So maybe let's start with that uh, from uh, Madeline Blidaru. Um, uh, so I guess that's for you, Oli. Have the Finnish financial and banking sectors been impacted by cyber attacks uh, after February 24? I don't know if you can answer that one. Thank you. It's a, it's a very pertinent question indeed. And uh, I, I try to answer to it uh, to the extent uh, that is uh, uh, possible. Uh, in fact, uh, we have uh, continuously over the past years. Uh, I've been I've been in this uh, job uh, soon five years and uh, started uh, at the, the Bank of Finland uh, in 2017. Uh, was member of the board uh, before becoming governor in 2018. Mm -hmm. And uh, during all these years, uh, we've seen uh, say continuous uh, activity of uh, cyber attacks. Uh, uh, against uh, uh, both uh, uh, the Bank of Finland and uh, especially uh, uh, private uh, private banks uh, or other other kind of uh, commercial banks, uh, cooperative banks. Uh, uh, so it's kind of a everyday life, uh, and uh, you just have to be well prepared uh, and uh, be able to contain and uh, pre preempt and uh, and contain these uh, these attacks. Uh, uh, We've seen uh, some uh, attacks against uh, public institutions in Finland, uh, which uh, have been traced uh, to some uh, Eastern countries. Uh, uh, there was one case which was uh, made public uh, about uh, one, one year and uh, some months ago. Uh, I think it was uh, late 2021 when uh, some groups linked uh, to uh, uh, to uh, some uh, Chinese uh, communities, uh, apparently made uh, a cyber attack against uh, the Parliament of Finland, uh, which was made, uh, as I said, uh, made uh, made public at the time. So uh, we basically we know who are doing these attacks, uh, and uh, we are very well prepared. Uh, one interesting fact is that uh, it seemed, uh, on the basis of uh, some some data, that uh, there was somewhat less activism somewhat less knocking in the cyber attacking sphere against Finland uh, from uh, early February last year until uh, say mid-March last year, which uh, apparently indicated that uh, the resources of uh, a certain country had been uh, directed uh, mainly against uh, Ukraine. So it's a uh, daily life and you have to be well prepared and uh, we have uh, several uh, cybersecurity companies uh, that uh, we are working with uh, very actively and uh, and uh, trying to continuously enhance our capabilities in this uh, important field. Do you really want to comment on the level of activity? I mean, I'm no longer on the on the inside of these things, and so no longer privy to some of that inf information. But I, I do understand that um, that um, many countries, especially those who have um, position themselves quite um, quite actively or quite openly against um, against the war have seen a, some some variety increase. But again, you know what, what the governor is saying, we did see the um, a lot of increase of attack on Ukrainian infrastructure. These things do there there are there is limited bandwidth among <laughs> among the perpetrator countries, um, but also understand that they that um, many countries have also been assisting the Ukrainians in trying to countervail these, right? So there's um, 
there's that as well. So I do, I, the one thing I would sort of point to is that, um, that, you know, maybe I painted a little bit of a, um, a cloudy picture on some of these issues, but that there, that there seems to be very much an uptick in the cooperation, cross-border cooperation between countries and between, um, between different entity, responsible entities on this issue. So, Oli, you presented the uh, very impressive arrangements, backup, and, you know, um, uh, business continuity, as they would say, in the private sector. Um, I have two questions about this. One is, um, uh, have there been surprises uh, that you can share with us uh, since the beginning of the Ukraine war, uh, either in terms of, uh, you know, how these arrangements have been put in place or external factors that have affected them. Um, and the other question, uh, which was already uh, alluded to by Julia, is, uh, you know, not asking you to brag and uh, just uh, as a thing, you would never do that anyway. But uh, but but uh, how, how much of, um, can we do some benchmarking inside the European Union, particularly the Eurozone? Uh, I think it's fair to say that most countries are far behind, but how far behind? Uh, thank you, thank you, Nicola, for this uh, for these questions. Uh, uh, whether there have been uh, any surprises, uh, I think uh, one one thing I have to say is that uh, for quite obvious reasons, uh, the say the uh, specific details uh, uh, are quite uh, confidential in this field, and uh, I would try to avoid uh, getting too much into them. Likewise, uh, the technical or cooperative arrangements uh, which enable our backup systems uh, are highly confidential. But as you refer to surprises, uh, I think uh, one uh, positive surprise uh, for me has been uh, Ukraine's uh, capacity to uh, withstand uh, and uh, contain uh, cyber attacks uh, and uh, maintain its uh, critical financial infrastructure and even its uh, energy infrastructure until uh, Russia started uh, its uh, brutal uh, missile attacks uh, against uh, Ukraine's uh, uh, critical energy infrastructure. So I, I really admire the Ukrainians' uh, way of uh, using data centers outside, outside Ukraine, uh, using uh, apparently various kinds of uh, digital technologies, uh, and also uh, using uh, cloud uh, as uh, one element. Uh, and that's, for instance, uh, something that uh, we are ourselves uh, trying to learn more about, uh, because uh, previously, before the war, we did not uh, count uh, cloud as uh, a very reliable way of, uh, say, uh, secure banking activity or securing banking activity. Now, it seems that uh, there are more possibilities. Uh, but I have to say that my technical expertise uh, ends here. so. Uh, so uh, I can just say that uh, we are studying various uh, elements of uh, Ukrainian Ukrainian response, uh, also from uh, our point of view and our, and uh, from the European point of view as uh, as well. As regards benchmarking, uh, I would be quite uh, cautious of uh, getting into into it because uh, simply I don't know well enough uh, the other country systems. And uh, what I can say is that uh, we have uh, within. Uh, uh, within the European Union, we have, uh, in fact, uh, enhanced uh, uh, our capabilities uh, as a response uh, to the deteriorating uh, security environment. Uh, European Union has, for, inst has for instance, uh, updated uh, its uh, legislation on the resilience of uh, critical infrastructure, on the security of uh, network and uh, information systems, uh, as well as the Digital Operational Resilience uh, Act. Uh, there is also ongoing work uh, to improve uh, our general crisis uh, preparedness uh, and resilience uh, in, uh, in the European Union, as well as uh, anticipating uh, possible attacks and, uh, and uh, crisis. I have two questions about this, uh, maybe on follow-up, which are connected with uh, specifically what the ECB is doing and. Uh, of course, your involvement in the Euro system. Uh, one is something Julia uh, referred to, which is a digital Euro project, so a central bank digital currency. 
Uh, here's a question, obvious question, uh, picking up on Julia's remark, uh, is uh, has has the, the the story of the war in Ukraine and the, the risk awareness that comes from there, uh, uh, has that led to a change of approach or of direction in the Digital Euro project, which started before, or uh, is it unaffected basically by the new risk perceptions? And then I have kind of a broader question because obviously monetary uh, price stability, financial stability, all that is part of resilience. So, uh, so I would be uh, if you if you're willing to comment on that, I would be very very uh, very um, interested in your views of how it plays up the interaction. Uh, I mean, basically monetary policy issues uh, in the context of the discussion we're having. Thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Nicola, for this uh, these questions. First, on uh, on the digital euro and its uh, its role in this context, uh, I think. Uh, and it's a, it's a very important point. Uh, I would say that um, you have to, we have to distinguish between, uh, say, uh, the will and determination on uh, at one level, and uh, then uh, on the concrete work uh, at another level. What I mean is that uh, the concrete work uh, has been well planned, and it is uh, proceeding further. We have uh, at the governing council, we have endorsed. Uh, uh, the examination phase, uh, and uh, and uh, I would uh, expect that uh, we would move towards uh, the say the investigation phase, uh, so that uh, we would uh, we would uh, proceed towards uh, say uh, testing the digital euro in some years uh, from now. Uh, at the same time, uh, the crisis or the or the Russia's uh, brutal war attack against uh, Ukraine and uh, its ramifications uh, have uh, to my mind only reinforced uh, the political will and uh, the uh, say economic technological need uh, to uh, create uh, a digital euro it's actually is a, it's a it's a system of uh, digital currency and uh, payments uh, rather than only something uh, say, uh, symbolic uh, within uh, the digital wallet. And uh, here I see that uh, for the moment, uh, if you look at, uh, for instance, from the standpoint of, the, of a country like Finland, uh, our payment systems uh, are inter internationally are quite dependent on uh, two companies uh, which are located uh, on your side of the Atlantic. Uh, they are called Visa and uh, MasterCard. Uh, they are very competent companies, uh, very able companies, but at the same time, uh, that involves uh, certain uh, certain risks. Uh, and I see that uh, building up uh, the digital euro and the payment system, the digital payment system underneath uh, it, uh, is actually a factor of uh, enhancing cybersecurity and resilience uh, in our European uh, payment systems. And uh, I see the digital euro as a as a monetary anchor as uh, as well in this uh, in this context. So that's uh, that's what uh, the digital, digital euro will uh, will probably uh, help uh, achieving uh, in uh, in the banking system and uh, payment systems. Uh, then we have uh, another world which is uh, crypto crypto assets. Uh, let's not get into this, that that uh, we've been warning about that uh, for years. Uh, and then we have, uh, from another angle, a, a challenging sector, which is the non-banking sector, which is uh, a potential stability risk. Uh, but uh, that's not so much related to, uh, say, cyber. It's not, in the first place, not related to cyber security issues. Uh, did you did you want me to say something about uh, monetary policy as well, or? Yeah, I think it's it's a, it's a very important. Uh, important issue because uh, evidently monetary pol policy clearly has a central role in enhancing uh, economic uh, resilience and uh, stability. That's in fact our statutory duty uh, by stability. That's our core mission in the Eurozone. And uh, I'm well aware of the criticism uh, claiming that uh, central banks uh, acted uh, too late and uh, too cautiously to contain the rapidly surging inflation 
starting from the late uh, 2021. On the other hand, uh, I'm also well aware that uh, well aware of the more recent criticism uh, claiming that uh, the central banks are now reacting too hastily and uh, too forcefully and uh, supposedly risk uh, pushing the economy into a into a recession. Let me make two or three comments on this. Uh, this uh, first one is that uh, in late uh, 21, one could still think uh, that uh, the rapid rise in inflation uh, would, uh, even if prolonged, uh, still uh, probably be transitory over the medium term. Normally, supply side shocks uh, like the recent bottlenecks uh, in value chains, global value chains, and uh, the leap in energy prices uh, would be analyzed uh, through, and if deemed temporary, uh, we would uh, they, they would be passed. Uh, over in, in monetary policy. We, look, we would look through this uh, in monetary policy. However, since uh, latest, uh, the start of uh, Russia's uh, illegal, brutal attack on Ukraine, the assumption regarding the temporary or transitory nature of uh, the inflation shock uh, had to be thrown into a wastebasket uh, onto, a, onto the scrap heap. Especially in Europe, uh, where imported fossil energy from Russia has played a regrettably large role. And uh, this means also that uh, the cost of uh, the Eurozone's important imported energy has increased uh, last year to the to the extent of uh, three or maybe even four percent of GDP. And that's kind of, a, if not permanent, but a long lasting cut uh, in the living standards of, uh, of uh, Europeans. So the monetary policy response uh, to this uh, depends uh, at least partly on the assumptions that are made uh, about the reactions of uh, price and weight setters. Uh, while the uh, hefty price increases uh, began with energy prices, uh, more concerning, at least from the monetary point of monetary policy makers point of view is uh, that uh, inflation has uh, spread across uh, the entire economy to virtually all products and uh, services. And that's why at the ECB Governing Council, uh, we have uh, been tightening uh, monetary policy since uh, July last year by raising key policy rates uh, and by deciding to uh, gradually start reducing uh, our bond holdings uh, from March 23 onwards. This uh, sequence of uh, decisions uh, is in line with uh, our consistent uh, policy of uh, normalization, uh, monetary policy normalization, which the governing council started uh, in the end of uh, this in December 2021 already. Now, if we come to, to come to today, uh, so uh, the governing council decided uh, last month uh, to raise uh, the three key policy rates, uh, ECB policy rates by 50 basis points. Uh, the deposit facility rate uh, has uh, thus been increased uh, altogether from uh, minus half to the current level of uh, 2%. Policy rates uh, will still have to rise uh, significantly to reach levels that are sufficiently restrictive to ensure a timely return to the 2% uh, medium term inflation target. Uh, thus, uh, we will stay the course. Ceteris uh, paribus, uh, this means uh, significant uh, rate hikes uh, at uh, this winter's uh, remaining meetings, uh, yet uh, depending on the incoming data and uh, changes uh, in, the, in the outlook. I might add that uh, Raising interest rates uh, to restrictive levels will uh, over time reduce inflation by dampening demand. Uh, and more importantly, will also guard against uh, the risk of a persistent uh, upward shift uh, in uh, inflation uh, expectations. And maybe one, one point more, because uh, I think there is uh, one historical comparison and, uh, and uh, and many Americans also watch uh, Europe uh, from this uh, standpoint. Uh, uh, as said, there have been voices declaring, especially in retrospect, uh, that the ECB should have hiked uh, its rates uh, earlier 
and that uh, front loading should have been uh, more forceful. With the benefit of hindsight, uh, there may be some truth, truth in this argument, uh, not least from the standpoint uh, that we could uh, thus have created more policy space uh, to react uh, if the Eurozone economy falls into recession. I say this with a caveat, with a caveat that uh, immediately after the Russian invasion during the spring winter last year, there was a pervasive uncertainty about uh, the economic ramifications of Russia's war, especially in Europe, uh, which uh, justified uh, certain prudence uh, in, uh, in uh, making monetary policy. Anyway, by acting swiftly now, and here we come to, the, to economic history as well, by acting swiftly now, we should be able to avoid uh, what is often called uh, the Volcker shock, uh, which harks back to his uh, rigorous uh, disinflationary policies of the early 1980s uh, that had become necessary in that context uh, to stifle the stubborn uh, galloping inflation inherited from the 1960s and uh, 70s. But uh, policy is always made uh, in the context of uh, time and place uh, Today is not uh, 1981 or even 1974. What I, what I mean is that uh, following the long years of uh, stagflation in the 1970s, uh, excessively high inflation became entrenched uh, and the return to price st stability required uh, very strong disinflationary measures uh, at the cost of uh, a severe recession and uh, high unemployment. One reason for the prolonged uh, stagflation was that uh, the central banks uh, were not independent uh, at that time. Today, following the global financial crisis, uh, we've had uh, a lengthy period of uh, low inflation behind us uh, and uh, the longer and uh, medium term uh, inflation expectations uh, are still relatively well anchored. Our task, uh, now is to maintain this by making strong enough moves uh, now so that we can avoid a highly restrictive monetary policy shock uh, in the future. And uh, as the last word, uh, unlike uh, the 1970s, uh, today we have independent central banks uh, and uh, we'll do what we got to do to tame inflation and we do it uh, rationally. Thank you. Right. So um, we're, we've been drifting into monetary policy, but that was probably inevitable um, given the, 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 the context. Um, <clears throat> Julia, do you want to comment on the monetary policy side or any other of, of the other aspects you've uh, you we've been discussing? I'm especially interested in what uh, um, Governor Wren has said about the dependency on Visa and Mastercard. You may have uh, views on that, and uh, and and uh, and. All the, I mean, lots of topics here. Sure, and um, I think, I mean, I'm certainly not going to um, uh, breach the uh, strictly monetary policy topic, given given my my counterpart here. Um, but I mean, I mean, I do, you know, I do think that governments have, you know, in over the course of the last several years, whether as a result of um, of, of of COVID driven recession, um, downturn in China. Um, pressures um, popping up in unexpected and unexpected places as a result of the war, um, we, and we've entered we've entered an, an, an era of government spending. Look at you know what, what I mean. The U.S. government spending packages look like what the European Union has um, has uh, set forth. Um, loosening, uh, loosening uh, stability and growth pact rules, loosening uh, state aid rules, um, and I'm you know I'm in. Uh, in Berlin here, the, they're redoing the elections in, the st in, in Berlin because they screwed them up. Um, and there are big placards everywhere as I was walking to work this morning saying, we will relieve you. And, they, and, and, and they're just listing all the areas where the government has intervened in energy prices and, and, and I mean, across the board, uh, transportation costs to uh, to justifiably um, account for 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 skyrocketing costs, um, you know everybody was anticipating a 
ginormous gas bill, um, and they're not um, they're not feeling that as much as they might have. And again, that 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 requires government intervention. So as a result of that, all of the good work that our um, our colleagues in Frankfurt and in capitals are doing to try to um, to uh, to to rein in um, headline inflation are going to be um, a counter. I mean, a, you know, independent, but sort of a counterpoint with national governments, which have now set the precedent um, <laughs> with electorates that, well, when push comes to shove, we are going. We, we are going to spend right, and that's even with you know the the free democrats here running the finance ministry so that that's i mean that's that's sort of my what sort of rolls around in my head that that is um when we talk about resilience of the of the financial system it means in some ways throwing out some of the principles of resilience that we had um after the year after the eurozone crisis so that's you know we're 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 in a, a new era here um on visa and mastercard um, I, you know, I hear you. Um, there are other, there are other companies, <laughs> some in, some in Belgium, um, uh, that are also critical for, for that infrastructure as well. But yeah, but, the, but it shows that, you know, that where, who holds, who holds the ball in the end? Is it the private sector or the governments to, to ensure this, to, to, to ensure security? I'd like to have, uh, your views again on, uh, I mean, um, only of course, didn't want to say bad things about other countries, but, uh, it seems to me that in terms of preparedness and what was uh, the topic of the, uh, the governor's initial presentation, um, I, Finland is miles ahead of uh, most, if not all, other uh, EU member states, and certainly the big ones uh, on the Western side, uh, Germany, Italy, France, um, and more. Um, how... I. Do you sense an awareness of that in Western Europe and Central Europe? Do you do you see uh, policymakers trying to learn from uh, the Finnish experience or equivalents? Uh, maybe first to Julian uh, and and then back to Oli if he wants to comment. Um, I, I would say no, no. I mean, I, th I mean, I think that there, the what what's always surprised me. I mean, what's possibly I mean, look, I mean, I mean, um, when I, whenever I'm, I'm speaking to um, to counterparts on the front lines. Uh, is that of course they have a better, they have a much more sophisticated and advanced concept of of associated risk, and that's um, and and so and but also I, but some governments are just inherently better at working um, intersectionally um, between private and public sector, between governments. Usually smaller governments can be much can be much more nimble than larger governments. Um, I'm speaking as being an alumna of a very large government. Um, so, you know, that that I think sometimes that um, small and lean means uh, means uh, means more efficient. And that's a, a um, would, would speak to would speak more to a Finland than to a Germany or to a US. Um, um, I think that given given the, the the fractured nature of security infrastructure in um, in Germany, um, I would not I would not be surprised. I mean, again, like I haven't looked under the hood very, very recently that um, a country like a, a country like this one would be you know very very far behind in being able to counteract um, an attack of, of that scale, even though it has experienced them in the past, such as on the Bundestag. So. Only uh, do you get delegations trying to learn from your experience or not yet? Thanks. Uh, in the Euro system, uh, we have actually discussed uh, these issues uh, uh, even more intensively, of course, after the after the Russian attack uh, uh, to Ukraine. Uh, it may not be so visible, but I don't see that as a problem. Central bankers uh, often try to be boring and uh, not so visible. Uh, but uh, certainly resilience uh, of our payment systems uh, and uh, other infrastructure is uh, critical infrastructure is uh, is a key priority for us and uh, we do a kind of continuous uh, developmental work uh, in order to ensure that uh, target 2 and uh, and other systems which form the backbone of the infrastructure of uh, of the euro system are our state of the art in terms of uh, cyber security and uh, resilience. Uh, I think uh, Julia. Uh, so, sorry, just on this, do you have enough oversight authority? Because I remember the controversy a couple of years ago 
in terms of uh, you know ECB authority over payment system and infrastructure. There was a proposal of amending the treaty on the technical aspect on this, which was not retained by the council. Um, so, um, so is it your? I mean, I know the answer you have to give to that question, but uh, but does the ECB have enough uh, statutory authority to really fulfill the function you're talking about? The ECB and your system, of course. There have been discussions, as you as you described, uh, uh, on this, uh, but uh, I would say that um, we have uh, largely overcome these uh, legal hurdles, and uh, we are focusing on uh, pragmatic, practical, concrete uh, work uh, in this regard. Uh, and um, I think the the picture of uh, threats has also somewhat evolved. Uh, so uh, we are really focusing on uh, on uh, the work uh, to contain. Uh, uh, counter, counter cyber attacks and uh, other hybrid uh, warfare. And uh, for the moment, uh, from my standpoint, I think we have a, we have a fairly solid, uh, reasonable uh, legislation backing up uh, our work uh, in in concrete terms. I think Julia raised an important issue, many important issues, but uh, this uh, one on uh, on uh, um, the European Union uh, forgetting its uh, fiscal rules. Uh, for too long, and um, I think it was uh, justified that uh, we used uh, we. When I say we in this context, I mean all the Europeans. Uh, we as the European Union, uh, we decided to uh, uh, have a break uh, from uh, fiscal rules uh, in uh, 2020, 21, even even 22. But uh, now it's really the time to return to to a rules based uh, framework. Uh, I would prefer a reform of rules uh, pretty much along the lines of uh, what uh, the European Commission or the European Fiscal Board has uh, proposed, uh, which would mean a debt anchor linked to the observable uh, growth path uh, of uh, the member state, uh, and then uh, an expenditure rule, which uh, we have experienced from, uh, say, Sweden or the Netherlands, uh, which has facilitated uh, with, according to empirical evidence, it has facilitated uh, uh, sound uh, public finances. Uh, now it seems that, uh, regrettably, uh, the Swedish EU presidency is not uh, bringing uh, this into discussion in the next uh, uh, council meetings. Uh, I really hope that uh, I really would uh, insist that uh, we would have to have to have a serious debate about uh, fiscal rules and uh, restore. If not uh, a reformed framework, uh, then uh, say uh, the current framework with some uh, some applications, uh, so that uh, the member states uh, and their governments uh, and their finance ministers uh, would have uh, sufficient backing and uh, backbone in uh, restoring fiscal stability. Because I'm I'm really worried about uh, public finances uh, in the coming years, uh, and uh, we see that. Uh, even though we have uh, ourselves uh, from the governing council of the of the ECB, we have uh, encouraged uh, the member states uh, to to do uh, uh, energy support uh, for the most vulnerable people with a targeted uh, and temporary manner. It seems that uh, we are seeing uh, very high fiscal deficits uh, continued. Uh, this fiscal year, and uh, if we don't have a course in place for 24, this will continue also in 2024, and right. this uh, this calls for trouble uh, going ahead. So we would need a reform of the fiscal rules, and we would need a return a return to fiscal rules and uh, better fiscal monetary interaction in this regard. Very clear message, both to the member states and to the um, Swedish presidency uh, from the fellow Nordics um, and uh, NATO candidates. Uh, so, um, unfortunately, we're almost at the hour, and I have tons of more questions. There is a question about monetary policy from Joe Gagnon in the Q&A, but that's not technically the topic here. So, even so, we had uh, also very clear messages from you on that, uh, Governor Rehn. Um Maybe I'll, I'd like to conclude to come back on one of the points that Julia raised, and this is the uh, um, freezing uh, of the 
reserves of the Russian central bank, because that was one of the big actions of 2022. And there is obviously a debate now about confiscation. So maybe first to you, uh, Julia, and uh, briefly maybe also to you, Oli. Um, I mean, is there buyer's remorse here? Is it your impression that this was a disproportionate action in terms of its impact on the global monetary and um, financial system? Or do you think it was uh, the right thing to do back in uh, late February, early March? Um, well, I think it was the right thing to do. Um, I think that it was daring, um, but but given the situation where, you know, all the readings of the situation being to underestimate the Ukrainian resilience and to overestimate Russian command and control, you had to escalate to the top, go to the top of your escalation ladder as fast as possible. Because in that in that brief window of time, we were using financial means to try to counteract the ability to per, to, to persecute to, to 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 continue and 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 execute a war, right? So you were actually using a financial. I mean, I at the time, I you know, I don't like using the word financial warfare. Anything that involves finance shouldn't shouldn't be really in reference to anything that actually involves guns. But in that specific instance, I thought this actually is financial warfare because you're using it as a, as an actual stand-in for a military conflict. Um, and um, and so at the time it made it made sense. Um, I think that you know uh, no no one knew at the time exactly what the ramifications were going to be. And in the end, we overestimated the ability to um, to cause a financial crisis in Russia. Um, and so in the end, maybe we're actually underwhelmed by our <laughs> by our by our use of that. I think it's also a bit of a cautionary tale about you know. About the about freeze about using that tool specifically the freezing of access to reserves, because um, this is this was a specific instance where we could use it in in a, in a um, disproportionately beneficial way where it wouldn't affect us right and so um, I don't think this is going to happen again in this in this uh, in this kind of constellation so to speak. You have the last word. Thank you. I, I'm. I would agree largely with uh, with Julia and uh, and uh, from the European point of view, it was certainly the right thing to do. Russia has been, uh, to an extent, uh, so far, able to overcome the impact of uh, sanctions, uh, including the freezing of uh, of the assets of the central bank, Russian central bank, uh, by uh, higher oil and uh, gas prices, uh, which have uh, helped Russia to finance its uh, war. But I believe that uh, the more recent decisions uh, will help uh, reduce uh, this uh, uh, this uh, uh, impact uh, or this uh, ability of Russia to to overcome these, uh, these sanctions. Uh, I think uh, nobody should have expected that uh, the sanctions uh, have an immediate effect uh, of uh, stopping the war. Rather, they have uh, a medium term impact uh, and they uh, start to strangle the production capacity of, uh, of Russia, especially in uh, critical technologies uh, and uh, to finance the war. Uh, so uh, it is important that we maintain the maintain the sanctions. And uh, I think uh, it was really it was indeed uh, the right thing to, to do. And finally, I, I would say that uh, Vladimir Putin has uh, clearly underestimated uh, the resilience and the fighting spirit of uh, the Ukrainian people who deserve uh, full support uh, or support from uh, us Europeans and, uh, and other, others who are concerned about uh, liberty and democracy. And uh, Putin underestimated the uh, European unity and the unity in the West. Uh, and it's indeed very important that we maintain this unity and we maintain it in a way that is effective in supporting Ukraine and containing containing Russia. This is uh, still the, of course, the first and foremost priority in, in Europe uh, uh, in the in the period ahead. To conclude this session, thank you so much, uh, Julia Friedlander and uh, Oli Rain. Um, I we're a little bit uh, late on schedule, but I personally would like to. Um, continue even more. Um, the next session of the financial statement series will be on uh, January 26. We'll discuss the City of London. Uh, we had a very good session two years ago exactly on the first uh, 
uh, assessment of the impact of Brexit on the City of London uh, with William Wright of uh, New Financial. So William uh, will kindly come back two years later and we'll see how it goes. Uh, thanks very much again. Uh, uh, very heartfelt thanks to both our speakers and to the audience. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.